article for a French communist review in 1923. Trotsky fingered what he thought were the essential weaknesses, what he thought was the essential self-mystification of German social democracy before the First World War. And the way Trotsky put it was something like this, that for a whole generation of German socialists, the ones who entered the German Social Democratic Party after 1890 and built it and expanded it until 1914, that the organization, the party, became an end in itself. And that with very catastrophic consequences. With the consequence that the party leadership, the party executive on the one hand, the bureaucracy on the other hand, had a terrific vested interest in that organization and were very loath to risk it in any kind of direct context or direct confrontation with the established society. And that fundamentally, that establishment within German social democracy never really charted a strategy of revolutionary action, but instead assumed, or at least they said they assumed, that somehow the revolution would come spontaneously and inevitably at some certain point in the future, and that no real mass action was necessary. And you see, Trotsky was right on the bar in that particular observation, though it should be said parenthetically that like most revolutionaries in Europe before 1914, he didn't arrive at that understanding of German social democracy until that party had really drowned in a sea of chauvinism in the course of the First World War. But it is precisely true that the history of German social democracy before 1914 is a very long and extended commentary on the theme of the illusion and reality. A very searing commentary, if you please, on the proposition, very pertinent today when we think about the role of French or Italian communism, on the proposition that the function and the duty of revolutionary parties is not only, after all, to accumulate large numbers of members, not only to fill the treasury of those particular parties, but to utilize and exploit every effort opportunity, any and every opportunity that arises to push those contradictions of a capitalist society to the breaking point. That is the proposition, really, that is at stake when you analyze German social democracy before the First World War. And we talk, you see, about illusion and reality. Because if you look at that German party before 1914, you are overwhelmed by its strength. It really does look like the genuine article. It looks very much like the prototype of what Karl Marx was thinking about when in those waning days of the First International, after the crushing of the Paris Commune, he enjoined the national sections to form revolutionary political parties. And that SPD by 1914 really looked like the prototype of that kind of party. Is it a question, after all, of a proletarian base? that that German Social Democratic Party, more than any other in the entire Second International, really had a mass working class base. That by 1914, 74% of all of its members in that party came of working class origin. Is it a question of being a mass party more than any other organization in the Second International that SPD was a mass party? That it could point, after all, by 1913 to over a million paid members into that party. That it could look and point with pride to those four and a third million voters who had voted the Social Democratic <coughs> ticket in the last Reichstag elections before the war in 1912. Is it a question of a propaganda machine? A machine that can really grind out the socialist propaganda and diffuse it to every corner of Germany, then there is no party that had a propaganda machine like that German Social Democratic Party. We are talking about 89 daily newspapers in 1911. We are talking about a central national newspaper, Forward, Volvex, which had a circulation, if you please, of almost 2 million daily by 1911. And you compare that, for example, with the 50,000 that Rimani K in France finally reached by 1912. Is it a question of an entire network of auxiliary organizations? 
then you have this SPD with that network of affiliated trade unions, with that network of cooperative societies, with party schools, even with paid minstrels and poets, even with affiliates for women and for youth, all of them burgeoning, all of them structured, all of them organized. Is this not a massive revolutionary party? But we look, we look more closely, and the reality does not match the illusion, because this very structure, this very proliferating organization, really has a boomerang effect. It does not become a source of revolutionary strength. It becomes a source of conservatism and a source of immobilism. And that for two reasons especially that really you can well, well understand. One, because with a proliferating organization you already have a growing bureaucracy. A bureaucracy of trade union secretaries, of cooperative managers, of party journalists, a stratum of bureaucrats that have a vested interest in the status quo about whom Robert Michel writes so very well in that book, Political Parties, when he says, after all, that this party bureaucracy had a vested interest in keeping its power and its prestige and its emoluments and was loath to risk those in any kind of a confrontation with the society that might eventuate in a revolution. And so you have a bureaucratic stratum, and you must keep that in mind. But you develop something else out of this proliferating organization. And it's what we call a state within a state. And that concept is important because that concept of state within a state really begins to explain not only a great deal about German socialism before 1914, but if you think about it, explains a great deal about those burgeoning communist parties of Western Europe, like the one in France and like the one in Italy. What we are saying, after all, is that the leadership of that party had a vested interest in what really became a shadow society, a kind of shadow socialist society, a shadow empire within the empire, a government within the government, that after all, Babel himself was very proud of that. He went to the Congress of Vienna in 1911, and he referred to the leadership of the SPD as your government. And at every party Congress, great deals of time were expended in recounting how the services of the party had expanded, how many new cultural facilities had developed, that more time was expended in that than ever was expended in discussing substantive political questions, that after all the leadership had a government, it had a nation, and it was proud of its accomplishment and proud of the time and the money and the effort that had been put into building it, and it was loath to risk it. But that state within a state means something else. It means that German social democracy can, became a vast extended ghetto, a vast extended socialist ghetto, in which rank and file militants, after all, derived a certain psychic satisfaction derived certain cultural services that they were denied by the majority society. What I'm saying is that there is a camaraderie within that structure of German socialism, that there is a contact of one socialist with another, that there is a kind of ghetto in which people adapt themselves, in which they almost think that they are living socialism, and doesn't that begin to dull the cutting edge? Doesn't that begin to take the place itself of a revolutionary movement? Doesn't one feel safer and confident within that ghetto? And isn't that always the function of a ghetto? There is a woman whom I know very well in France, an old working woman named Suzanne Larose, whom I have known for many years, and who travels two hours every day from a red suburb outside of Paris, the suburb of choisy de bois two hours on a bus and metro to go to a dismal little textile factory where she has been working for over 20 years, hating her boss, hating the exploitation, and that Suzanne is tough, and she puts that thumb up, and she has tremendous elan and courage, and I say to her, how is it that you do that? 
and she says she goes back to Shwazi, which is after all a red suburb. And there she walks into the mayor Lee and she says, Savar George. And George is the mayor. And all of the communists in the town are her comrades. And she thinks she's living under communism. And that fundamentally that party becomes a kind of protection. It becomes a state within a state that gives her the very courage to go on and to continue the next day. Terrifically important. But when you ask militants of that kind, what does that mean in terms of the ultimate decisions in society that already is out of her mind and not part of the problematique that she raises? But when we say state within a state, we do not mean what Mao meant by a revolutionary base. Because this ghetto was not a revolutionary base in that sense. The institutions that were planted within that huge social democratic establishment were replicas of the institutions on the outside. That there was no questioning, for example, of the institution of marriage, the institution of the family, the institution of sexual codes, the institution of the relationship of the lead to the leaders. All of that was reproduced in exactly the same terms as on the outside. What I'm saying is that there is a kind of stasis, a staticity within this particular ghetto, that every question, every issue is touched, but it is touched very lightly and gone over very lightly, almost in a pro forma way. Is it a question of women? My God, the Social Democratic Party of Germany put more women under the flag of socialism than any party. 142,000 women were members of the SPD in 1914, and 115,000 of them were subscribers to Gleichheit, which was the theoretical feminist magazine published by Clara Zetkin. But when the party dealt with the question of women, it dealt with it in a thoroughly derisive way. It never probed to the radical depths of what women's oppression was, but that party of men told women that their function, after all, was to build the electoral success of that social democratic party, because when socialism should finally accede to power, then the problems of women would be resolved. Even in questions of sexual repression, the SPD took its pro forma stand. Was there not the only single movement uh, to try to remove the oppression against sexual minorities that took place before World War I, that took place in Germany in the 1890s and early 20th century? The so-called Scientific Humanitarian Committee, which wanted to remove Article 175 of the Criminal Code of Germany, which Article 175 discriminated in such a draconian way against those who were of sexual minorities, and consequently who mounted a movement for that. And when the debate took place in the Reichstag, sure, they will make one short speech in favor of the removal of that discrimination, and that was all. It was a pro forma lip service to some kind of change that never really dug deeply within the framework of that socialist ghetto. So you see, the burning question before German social democracy for 20 years is the question of what you do with that organization. What is the relationship between the party and society? How do you use that proliferated organization? Is there a revolutionary vocation in the German Social Democratic Party? Those are the burning questions, just as they are the burning questions for the PCF or for the Italian Communist Party today. What is the relationship between party and society? And you see, it is really to those questions that Bernstein and the very outspoken reformists address themselves in that entire revisionist brouhaha that really dominated party debates between 1898 and 1903. Because Bernstein wrote a book in 1898 called The Underlying Assumptions of Socialism and the Tasks of Social Democracy. Not a very hot popular title, to be sure. 
But it suffices to say that in that book, Bernstein laid out what he considered to be his basic premises. One, that Marx was wrong when he talked about the inevitable collapse of capitalism. That capitalism wasn't collapsing. In fact, it was recovering from a long depression and was showing a tremendous power of adaptation. Secondly, that the working class now had in hand certain institutions, parliamentary democracy, the trade unions, the cooperatives, which institutions would enable it to ameliorate its condition. Third, that the scientific base of Marxism, as it was called, was all phony and all wrong. There would be no inevitable collapse of capitalism. You couldn't talk about these contradictions growing deeper. That the only sound base for socialism was a moralistic one, to appeal to the rest of society for greater justice and equality. So that in the final analysis, what Bernstein is saying to the party is, have the courage to be what you are and what you always will be, namely a reformist democratic party. Now it's terrifically interesting that the groups that supported Bernstein within German social democracy were the ones that had broken out of the ghetto were the ones that really had interaction with the majority society or with the establishment. Uh, we're talking about trade union leaders who bargained, after all, with capitalists. Uh, we're talking about the South German socialists, like von Volma, the people of Bavaria and Baden and Hesse, who, after all, entered into the parliaments, voted in their provinces for the budget, made alliances with progressive bourgeois parties, and got reforms. These are people who were saying, you see, our answer, the answer of the revisionists to the question of the relationship between the party and society is proximity. Get close to the society, but get close to it so that you can collaborate. Get close to it so that you can reform. Get close to it so that you can ameliorate conditions. It is proximity for reform, proximity for class collaboration. Now this raised hell with the orthodox Marxists in the party. Those who were in the leadership like Babel, those who were the ever-ready theorists like Karl Kautsky. And in successive party congresses, the Congress of Dresden in 1903, the Congress of Bremen in 1904, the International Congress of Amsterdam in 1904, they attacked revisionism and defeated it. Now this strikes us as being surprising because these are the same guys that are really lauding parliamentary action that all through the 1890s are standing very askance of any tactic that looks violent or illegal are saying that the mission of German social democracy is really to win elections and to increase its parliamentary deputation. This is a leadership, after all, that did the impossible. In 1895, truncated a text of the venerated Engels. Engels, a few months before his death, writing something for the German paper Vorwärts and having the text truncated so that it shouldn't seem too violent. Now, you don't go piecing up a text of Engels. That's really like talking up a statue of the Virgin. And consequently, here is Engels writing an introduction to the class struggles in France, 1848 to 50 of Marx, and that introduction published. And he's saying, good, that the SPD has picked up a lot of electoral strength. Good, that it is winning election because he asks, it will then be able to rally those shock troops for the decisive struggle, and that sentence they crossed out. And for 40 years, it was never printed in Germany. And consequently, a group like that, why should it be so obsessed with attacking Bernstein and with attacking the revisionists? And here you get something very important. The question was not revolution. The question was status quo. The question was keeping that party together and keeping it big and keeping it growing. The leadership, the theorists, 
they had a vested interest in a party that appeared to be revolutionary. If they became a party as Bernstein wanted, they would be a pressure group like any party. And how would they be able to keep their troops? How would they be able to keep those workers who dreamt of socialism? To keep that party together, even if you were not a party of revolutionary praxis, you had to be a party of revolutionary illusion, and consequently you had to beat down the revisionists, and you had to get Kautsky to turn Marxism from an instrument of revolutionary practice, from a guide to revolutionary practice, into an ideology. An ideology which said that inevitably there would be socialism which fed that faith. If we need proof that that defeat of revisionism didn't change the party's behavior, that it was no more revolutionary after the defeat of revisionism than before. We have it in the debate over the general strike in the German Social Democratic Party. That general strike or the mass strike, a terrifically important issue in that decade before 1914 when inflation is cutting into the working class. How else can that working class defend itself? And in Germany by 1905, even though the leadership had so opposed anything like a general strike, that issue came before the party, in part because there was a little anarcho-syndicalist group in the SPD, led by a Dr. Raphael Friedeberg. And that little group kept saying, general strike, general strike, it's the only mission of the party. But more than that, there had been, in January of 1905, an immense wildcat strike that had broken out among the miners in the rural coal fields, and that had really been monumental in its proportion. And that meshed with the outbreak of the Russian Revolution of 1905, that bloody Sunday of the 22nd of January, with its immense momentum built on the basis of mass strikes, and all of that meshed with a threat in German society, a threat to curtail universal suffrage, that three-class system that Prussia already suffered under had been extended the year before to Saxony. There were other states that were thinking of truncating universal suffrage. And might not the Reichstag do it in terms of national elections themselves? Wasn't it necessary to find some defensive weapon against that possible threat to universal suffrage? And so the general strike was an issue talked about. And the trade union movement met at Cologne in May of 1905. And that general confederation of German trade unions, very conservative, under Karl Lepien. And that general confederation debated the general strike and hated it. And they said that it is not for the trade unions, that it will deplete the treasury of the trade unions, that it will destroy their opportunity to organize more workers, that it will lead to repression, and then they did dirty things, and they made anti-Semitic remarks against Rosa Luxemburg, and they said that the general strike is just a ploy of intellectuals who have no place in the party, and they voted down the general strike, but it came up in September of 1905 at the Congress of Jena of the SPD, and by that time, Bain had been persuaded that perhaps the general strike was a defensive weapon against the truncating of universal suffrage. And so, after a vigorous speech by Rosa Luxemburg, Babel spoke for a very limited, planned, charted kind of general strike run by the party itself, controlled by the party itself, for a specific defensive end, and that passed. And Rosa knew that that really wasn't much of a resolution. And she said, after all, in the mass strike, in talking about the difference between the mass strike as passed in a resolution at the Congress of Vienna and the mass strike as it appeared in Russia, 
What is meant by it in Germany is a single grand rising of the industrial proletariat springing from some political motive undertaken on the basis of an opportune and mutual understanding on the part of the controlling authorities of the party and of the trade unions carried through in a spirit of party discipline and in perfect order, you see, never letting it get out of hand, and in still more perfect order, brought to a halt. Now, when we compare this theoretical scheme with the real mass strike as it appeared in Russia, we are compelled to say that this representation, which in the German discussion occupies the central position, hardly corresponds to a single one of the many mass strikes in Russia uh, which have such a multiplicity and such a variety of form. But even that resolution was cancelled the next year because the trade unions wouldn't have it. And consequently, the chief of the trade union movement, Le Guin, went to Babel and said very bluntly, if you insist upon this mass strike resolution, we, the trade unions, will get out of the party. And consequently, you will lose a great mass base for recruiting voters and for recruiting members. And consequently, at the Congress of Mannheim, in September of 1906, which followed, after all, that debate and that <laughs> conversation with the trade unions at that SPD Congress of Mannheim, it was decided that on any substantive strategic question, the trade union leadership of Germany, inscribed in the Social Democratic Party, would have parity of influence and voice. That in other words, there could never be a mass strike or a general strike because the trade unions would have a veto that they would be able to cancel any such strategy, any such program. How then to resolve the contradiction? How to resolve the contradiction of not being revolutionary and wanting to look revolutionary, of not wanting to mix in struggle and standing apart, and yet, after all, claiming that your mission is socialism, how to do that impossible thing, not difficult if you have Kautsky in your party. <laughs> and consequently, it is Kautsky, after all, who produces an astonishing book in 1909 called Der Weg zur Macht, The Way to Power or the Road to Power. And it was a Watergate moment in German history that there were all kinds of scandals in the emperor's circle, that political parties were tainted with scandal, that it looked as though the parties and the whole political structure really was collapsing under moral decay. And within that context, Karl Kautsky, in the way to power, raised the whole problematic of moral decay to the level of a revolutionary principle. And what he said was that if the Social Democratic Party only stays pure and strong, it will inherit the society. It will stay strong internally by purity of doctrine. It will stay strong in terms of its external appearance by a good show at the elections of 1912 in which it made an excellent show. And you see you are face to face with Kautsky's incredible fantasy that revolutions are self-generating, that if there is only, after all, a party big enough and pure enough and integral enough without any mass action, it will reap the whirlwind, it will be able to harvest the discontent, and it will be able to pick up the pieces of victory, and it is with that kind of faith, after all, that you get the second answer to the question of the relationship of the party to society. Not proximity, but distance this time. But distance, which is distance of passivity, that you do not come close to the society, you remain ostensibly in your purity, insisting that you are revolutionary, insisting that you stand for socialism. And isn't there a third answer? Isn't there an answer that it is not proximity and collaboration, not distance and immobilism, but proximity and struggle? That the function of the party is to get in there every day and struggle? Isn't that an answer? Of course. It is the answer of the revolutionary left. 
in the German Social Democratic Party. It is the answer of the revolutionary left in the Second International, and it brings us face to face with Rosa Luxemburg. Because it is this Rosa Luxemburg who is the head and heart of that revolutionary left, who lived and died as a revolutionary Marxist, who dedicated it all to the principle that the continual struggle is the only way for a socialist and a socialist party to live. And when I say that she died for that, you know it, that she lay face down in that river in January of 1919, bloodied and beaten out of all recognition, a martyr not only of communism, which she was, but a victim of those Abel and those Noska, those clients of the bourgeoisie in social democracy whom she so despised. And you see, we know Rosa Luxemburg as an indomitable militant, and we know her as a terrific intellectual, but before we go further, know her also as somebody who sacrificed a lot, because this is really a very human and needful woman. This is a woman, after all, who feels all of the needs that any human being does, who all of her life, after all, wanted to live tranquilly and quietly, who liked nice robes when she went and spoke before meetings, who liked nice furniture in her apartment, all of that bourgeois taste, we might say. And read, for example, those incredible letters that she writes to Leo Yogacevs. And Yogacevs, after all, is central to her life. The man she began to love in 1890 and loved until she died. He also a Polish Jew like herself, also a revolutionary, and all of their lives going apart. He militating in Poland, she militating in Germany, and in those three volumes of letters that are published in the Polish and then translated by my old and good comrade Victor Fay into French, we read this remarkable letter of the 6th of March of 1899 from Rosa to Leo, which is very typical of so many letters in that book. The only thing that sustains me is the passage in your last letter where you say that we are still young enough and that we will one day be able to live peacefully together. And how I dream of it, our small flat, our library, walks in the countryside, occasionally the opera, a small circle of friends invited to dinner, and maybe even a child, Leo. And will I ever have a child? And what are we to make of this Rosa, who when she is 44 years old, sees young Konstantin Zetkin, who is the 21-year-old son of her great friend Clara Zetkin, and who begins a year and a half affair with him? Are we to say that this is bizarre and bohemian behavior? The point is, you see, that Rosa Luxemburg had the needs that anybody did and never satisfied them and ended up face down in the river. And that's the point. And you see, she came out of Poland, a refugee in 1889, of a small clandestine group that she had joined as a high school student and went to Switzerland and there studied and took a doctorate in economics in 1897, engaged in what is called a mariage blanc, simply a legal marriage with a man named Lübeck, so that she could get into Germany, and arrives in Germany to militate there for the rest of her life in 1898. And as soon as she arrives, the Bernstein com conflict is already at its height, and she makes an immediate contribution to it. In the Leipziger Volkszeitung, she writes a series of articles in 1898 and 9, which you know as the brochure of reform and revolution. And she is really quite with the orthodox Marxists then. She doesn't see the party and the party leadership as a tremendous burden to revolution. 
And so what she says in that tract is not very original. What she does is to unhinge Bernstein in the same ways, that the adjustments of capitalism are only temporary, that reforms will never transform a society, that the moral basis of socialism that Bernstein talks about will only lead to class collaboration. And yet, you see, there is something a little different in this tract of Rosa even at that point. Not only because she actually names names when she circumscribes reformists in the party. She already talks about von Volba. She talks about those Bavarians. And she says we have this sickness in our party. But also because in two very pregnant passages, she points out what she means by continual struggle already. She's not thinking about isolation and distance. She's thinking that the revolution is that kind of continuous confrontation. It is impossible to imagine that a transformation as formidable as the passage from capitalist society to socialist society can be realized in one happy act. To consider that as possible is again to lend color to conceptions that are clearly blanquistes. The socialist transformation supposes a long, continuous, stubborn struggle, in the course of which it is quite probable that the proletariat will be repulsed more than once, so that, for the, so that the first time, from the viewpoint of the final outcome of the struggle, it will necessarily come to power too early. And in another passage in which he is dealing then, in which he is dealing with the same problem, she puts it this way. The forward march of the proletariat on a world historic scale to its final victory is not a simple thing. The peculiar character of this movement resides precisely in the fact that here, for the first time in history, the popular masses themselves, in opposition to the ruling classes, are to impose their will. This will, the masses can only form in a constant struggle against the existing order. And you see already the outline of what is writ in the mass strike. That the will, the consciousness, that which becomes the combustible material, is possible only in that constant friction with the society. But at that point, reform and revolution is within the cadre of the party leadership's response to Bernstein. And so then the party flames Bernstein. They do it in 1901. They do it in 1903. They do it in 1904. And Rosa gets suspicious. And she gets suspicious because as they flame the revisionists and the reformists, they come forth with nothing to replace that particular doctrine of collaboration. What is their strategy if they are so revolutionary? That is what she writes in that letter to Roland Holtz, to her friend, that Dutch militant of such high strife. And she writes to Roland Holtz in 1904, after the Congress of Amsterdam, chasing after each opportunistic hair and yakking critical advice doesn't satisfy me anymore. The only means of radical struggle against opportunism is to move forward oneself to enlarge the range of tactics, to increase the revolutionary aspect of the movement. And so she has begun to suspect that apparatus. And so she has begun to suspect that the party and the trade unions, that they have become vested interests, and that maybe that's not the way you make a revolution. And she makes her first public foray into that using Lenin as a whipping boy. Because we know that Rosa made her first repost of several to Lenin. It was a convoluted affair, Lenin and Luxembourg. And the first of those clashes was to come in 1904, when Rosa wrote in the Neue Zeit a series of articles called The Question of Organization in Social Democracy, which Western editors, in all of their joy over revolutionary spiking, have translated as Marxism or Leninism. The title is The Organizational Question in Social Democracy. But it's much hotter when you say Leninism versus Marxism, and that's not what Rosa Luxemburg was saying. 
Now we know what the substance of that debate is, that Lenin had written a tract at the end of 1902, published in 1903, called What is to be Done, a very seminal and important tract, as you know, in which he addressed himself to the problem of what kind of a party the German Social Democrats ought to organize and for what reason they ought to organize that party. Now we know that Lenin in that tract really grew out of certain Russian conditions, that what he was concerned about was to answer a cluster of reformists whom he labeled the economists. And those social reformers were socialists who were saying that it was premature to organize an official political party, that the proletariat had not advanced sufficiently in Russia, that what the workers were doing was going on strike in the late 1890s and forming unions, and that what Russian revolutionaries ought to do is to help the workers in those strikes, to support them, and then to support the liberal opposition to Tsarism so that the workers had the freedom to do their particular economic acts. And the economists added that through their struggle, the workers would come to a level of consciousness that would make them viable materials for organization. And Lenin wrote what is to be done to answer these economists and to insist upon the need for a party. Now you see, the basis of the conflict between Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg was not the fact that Lenin turned to the question of party organization. Luxemburg was perfectly in agreement that if you had a goal, you had to design a party commensurate with that goal. In other words, the only people that never raised the organizational question were the people who didn't know where they were going. If you don't know where you're going, any party will take you there. But Lenin knew where he was going and consequently had to design a party commensurate with that particular goal. In that sense, Rosa Luxemburg is in perfect agreement. Secondly, she is really not so concerned about the specifics of the Russian question. What really was the point of differentiation was a theory of consciousness. Because, you see, in Lenin's argument for a revolutionary party, he said that left to their own devices, the workers will never develop a revolutionary consciousness, but only a trade union consciousness. They will be concerned only with bread and butter questions that a revolutionary consciousness, what makes them a class able to struggle against the ruling class, has to be transported and infused into that proletariat by an intelligentsia on the outside, an intelligentsia in this instance represented by a revolutionary party. And since the conditions in Russia are not democratic conditions, since they are autocratic czarist conditions, that it will take a small clandestine party of professional revolutionaries in order to accomplish that task. A very ultra-centralist view of the party. Now Rose's objection, of course, was on the question of what creates consciousness. Because whereas Lenin was saying, that that consciousness has to be transported from the outside. Rosa Luxemburg was saying that it is that outside party which frustrates the revolutionary consciousness of the workers, that it is mass action which is the basis of that consciousness. She is arguing with Lenin from the German conditions. She is saying that we have not too much mass action but too little that we have too much party and not too little, that our conditions are different than the ones that Lenin is describing. And so, for example, she writes this, the working class demands the right to make its own mistakes and learn from the dialectic of history. Let us speak plainly. Historically, the errors committed by a truly revolutionary movement are infinitely more fruitful than the infallibility of the cleverest central committee. 
The tendency is for the directing organs to play a conservative role. If there is inertia and overemphasis on parliamentary tactics in Germany, this is the result of too much direction rather than of too little. And so using that ploy of the debate with Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg is already out on the firing line saying, haven't our organizations missed the whole strategic point? Haven't they been muzzling what people ought to be doing in their confrontation with society? And all of this exploded like a bombshell in the track, the mass strike, the political party, and the trade unions. And that came out, of course, of the revolution of 1905 in Russia, which magnetized Rosa Luxemburg. She went up and down Germany, lecturing and preaching on the lessons of those general and mass strikes in that Russian Revolution of 1905. Finally, she couldn't resist going there. In December of 1905, she went to Poland to observe these strike actions at first hand. By the 4th of March of 1906, she had been arrested for revolutionary propaganda and consequently put in prison, released only the 1st of August of 1906, and expelled out of Poland. She went to Finland. There she sat for several weeks and wrote this track on the mass strike. And you see, she says powerful things in it. She says, first of all, in addressing herself to her own party, don't look at what went on in Russia as something parochial and of interest only there. That the Russian Revolution has universality. Clearly, from any point of view, it would be totally mistaken to regard the Russian Revolution as a beautiful spectacle, as something specifically Russian. It is vital that the German workers should regard the Russian Revolution as their own affair, not only in the sense of solidarity with the Russian proletariat, but as a chapter of their own social and political history. You see what she's saying. She's saying, I want you to look at this because this is what you ought to be doing. If, therefore, the Russian Revolution teaches us anything, it teaches, above all, that the mass strike is not artificially made, not decided at random, not propagated, but that it is an historic phenomenon which at a given moment results from social conditions with historical inevitability. And she then goes into that magnificent description of how this strike develops, that magnificent description of how you move from economic to political strife, how you move from village to city and from city to village, how you move from one issue to the other, how the entire action begins to catalyze grievances everywhere. According to the theory of the lovers of orderly and well-disciplined struggles, according to plan and scheme, according to those especially who, have, who always ought to know better from afar how it should be done, the decay of the great general strike of January 1905 into a number of economic struggles was probably a great mistake, which crippled that action and changed it, changed it into straw fire. But social democracy in Russia, which had taken part in the revolution but had no, by no means made it, and which had even to learn its law from the course itself, was at the first glance put out of countenance for a time by the apparently fruitless end of the storm flood of the general strike. History, however, which had made that great mistake, thereby accomplished, heedless of the reasonings of its officious schoolmaster, a gigantic work for the revolution which was as inevitable as it was incalculable. The sudden general rising of the proletariat in January under the political impetus of the St. Petersburg events was outwardly a political act of the revolutionary declaration of war on absolutism. But this first general direct action reacted inwardly all the more powerfully as it for the first time awoke class feeling and class consciousness in millions upon millions, as if by an electric shock. And this awakening of class feeling expressed itself forthwith in the circumstances that the proletarian mass, counted by millions quite suddenly and sharply, came to realize how intolerable 
was that social and economic existence which they had endured for decades in the chains of capitalism. And she goes on to show how every grievance, every grievance, at one time or another came to be expressed. And then she turns on her organizations. And she says to the German trade unions, you see, you see what that Russian episode proved is that your contention that organizations have to be built in advance is wrong. That organizations are built strongly and creatively out of struggle. That the Russian top proletariat, which was disorganized and unorganized, not only formed unions, but formed workers' councils, took over shops, took over factories. That fundamentally, the organization came out of the struggle the rigid mechanical bureaucratic conception cannot conceive of the struggle, save as the product of organization at a certain stage of its strength. On the contrary, the living dialectical explanation makes the organization arise as the product of the struggle. We have already seen a grandiose example of this phenomenon in Russia, where a proletariat, almost wholly unorganized, created a comprehensive network of organizations in a year and a half of stormy revolutionary struggle. And then she turned to the party and she said, and you see, you said that you can't risk anything until you have spread around enough propaganda. What is this propaganda? When is it ever enough? And doesn't it come out of a certain kind of reality? The class consciousness of German workers remains theoretical and latent only in direct action. When the masses themselves appear on the political battlefield, does class consciousness become active and political? A year of revolution has given the Russian proletariat what 30 years of parliamentary and trade union actions cannot artificially give to the German proletariat. And then she turns directly at the whole apparatus and accuses them, in as many words as you want, accuses them of suppressing what is the revolutionary potential of the mass. And so she says, the initiative and power of making decisions the evolve upon trade union specialists, so to speak, and the passive virtue of discipline devolves upon the mass of members. The dark side of official nut conceals the horrendous dangers that the party now run. And consequently, you're saying about Rosa Luxemburg now that she is making her case for spontaneity. Here is the problem. What is this spontaneity of Rosa Luxemburg? And where does it fall? And what is its legacy? Is she a donkeys? Does she believe, for example, that a mass rises up and with one stroke makes a revolution? Of course not. The revolution to Rosa Luxemburg is an era. It is small battles and large battles. It is gains and victories, all of them addressing themselves to the crisis of capitalism. It is an era that is a revolution, and she proves that in her tract on the Russian Revolution by going back for a decade and pointing out how this kind of great mass strike maturated in 1905. But more complex is she an anarchist, and she is so accused. And it is true, you see, that she comes in a party that detested anarchists. He hated anarchists like a plague. And after all, when it expelled the Junge in 1891 at the Congress of Erfurt, when the party leadership said that Wilhelm and all of those people who were attacking the, the, the bureaucracy, who were attacking the conservative of the party were anarchists, Liebknecht, the great Liebknecht, got up and said that anarchism is and always will be counter-revolutionary. And Rosa Luxemburg, you see, in those early years, absorbed that kind of anti-anarchism and did it at least pro forma. And it's not until 1918 when she's reviewing in her mind all of the betrayals of German social democracy that she looks back at those young ones in 1891 and says, not a bad lot, you know. And they, after all, hold the turn on parliamentary cretinism and deserve some credit for that. 
And yet, you see, when it comes to writing the mass strike, she has to make a long introduction in which she says, this has nothing to do with Bakunin, this has nothing to do with the anarchist version of the mass strike. And we know why she did that. We know, after all, that she was concerned not to bring the attack of the reformists down on her head so that they could say that she was nothing but an anarchist, and they said it anyway. And the Trade Union Congress put out a brochure in 1908 in which they said that this brochure of Rosa Luxemburg was pure anarchist pap. And Kautsky in 1913 says that Rosa always had a deep streak of anarcho-syndicalism in her. <laughs> and even Roland Holst, her very faithful biographer, says that there was a very real syndicalist side to Rosa Luxemburg. The point is that her version of the mass strike is very similar to Bakunin's version of the mass strike. That for all of her disclaimer, it is very close. But attention. Because Rosa Luxemburg is not an anarchist, and she is not an anarchist on a fundamental ground, and that is that she is a party person. And she does believe in the party, and she believes in a certain role in the party, and that is the real problem. You see, the problem is what is, and it is the one that grows a poem, what is the relationship between spontaneity and consciousness? What is the relationship between an elite avant-garde party and the proletarian mass? And it is on that question that Rosa Luxemburg wrote so many texts and never really came to a conclusion. You see, she is accused of being a blind spontaneous. And for a certain reason, that is, Rosa really had almost a mystical faith in the mass. And that mystical faith in the mass really did her in, in 1919. In 1919, after all, she and the others who founded the German Communist Party at that time looked at that Berlin Street uprising of January and said it will never do, it will be repressed, we will all go down in bloodshed. But she was no lemon. She couldn't do what Lenin did in July of 1917 with the Bolsheviks and say, if it's wrong, call it back, no matter how much a defeat it looks. She couldn't do that. Once the masses were out on the street, she was there with them, and it took her to her death. And on the other hand, her attacks on parties and what parties do in restraining people are very consistent. You go all the way back to a text of 1899 in which she's talking about the Dreyfus affair in France. And she looks at the so-called revolutionary parties like the Gettist or the Blanquist. And she said, you know, you look at them closely and they are afraid of mass action. And then you see when that Belgian general strike comes in 1902. And she said the leadership of the unions and the leadership of the party is held back on keeping it within legal bounds. It is not an avant-garde party, it is an arrears party. It is a party that trails behind. And in 1906, she said, after all, that in Russia, it proved that the masses were in advance of the party. And yet, having said all that, she says also in this tract on the mass strike, she talks about the party this way. The mass strike in Russia and the element of spontaneity play such a predominant part, not because the proletariat are uneducated, but because revolutions don't allow anyone to play the schoolmaster with them. What then is the duty of social democracy in the revolution? Instead of puzzling their heads with the technical side, with the mechanism of the mass strike, the social democrats are called upon to, uh, to assume political leadership in the midst of the revolutionary process. Consistent, resolute, pragmatic tactics on the part of social democracy produces in the masses a feeling of security and a desire for struggle. There is a place for that party, but what really is the place? And there is a text of Rosa Luxemburg that comes from the 26th of June of 1912. And puzzle this with me. The power of the proletariat is founded on its class consciousness and on the revolutionary energy which derives from it and on the independent, resolute policy of social democracy, which alone can unleash that energy of the masses and make it a decisive factor in political life. 
But where does the energy come from? Does it come from the mass or does it come from the party? And Rosa Luxemburg never tells us. And what kind of a party is it that will direct the mass but never dominate that? What kind of a party is it that will adjust and accommodate to spontaneity and never stifle it? Certainly not the SPD, which she fought all of her life for its parliamentary cretinism and trade unionism. Certainly not the ultra-centralism of Lenin, which she attacked over and again. There was another kind of a party in her head, and it's described only once by Rosa Luxemburg. And it is described in the founding program of the German Communist Party, which she writes at the end of 1918, and which tells what kind of a party she really is thinking about. And she says, but even before these steps can be taken, the members of our party and the proletarians in general must be schooled and disciplined. Even where workers and soldiers councils already exist, these councils are as yet far from understanding the purposes for which they exist. We must make the masses realize that the workers and social soldiers council has to be the central feature of the machinery of the state, that it must concentrate all power within itself and must utilize all powers for the one great purpose of bringing about the socialist revolution. Those workers who are already organized to form workers and soldiers' councils are still far from having adopted such an outlook, and only isolated proletarian minorities are as yet clear as to the tasks that devolve upon them. You see, she's saying the function of the party is to tell the people that the power is theirs, to tell them that they can have it, that they must have it, that they must organize those councils that will express it. But there is no reason to complain of this, for it is a normal state of affairs. The masses must learn how to use power by using power. There is no other way. We have, happily, advanced since the days when it was proposed to educate the proletariat scholastically. Marxist Sapkowski school are, it would seem, still living in the vanished days. To educate the proletarian masses socialistically meant only to deliver lectures to them then. But it is not by such means that the proletarians will be schooled. The workers today will learn in the school of action. They will learn that they are the masters of society. Beautiful. But where is such a party? And the one that she founded in 1918 and didn't live really to see founded itself in its own kind of bureaucracy. Rosa, you see, never really resolved that problem of the relationship of spontaneity and party, never really gave us a formula that told us what the relationship between consciousness and spontaneity is between party and mass, but that doesn't diminish the accomplishment. The accomplishment was enormous. It was to finger what looked so great, to finger the fetishism of trade unionism, to finger the parliamentary cretinism of that party and to say it will not do, and to go down fighting all of those last years before 1914, when she circumscribed imperialism as the great danger. Imperialism defined in a technical way in the accumulation of capital as the essential need for non-capitalist states to exploit workers, to exploit raw materials, but more than that, imperialism as a culture Imperialism, as she defined it in 1911, militarism, closely connected with colonialism, protectionism, power politics, a frenetic arms race, colonial robbery, oppression in home and foreign affairs, a state of affairs we're all too familiar with. She defined a culture of imperialism and she said, you see, the class struggle is everywhere in a society like that, and do understand that. And do consequently mount those general strikes, mount those mass strikes. You have an obligation to do it. The party didn't listen. It went to the elections in 1912 and got its 110 deputies, proudly counted them. 1911, the Congress of Vienna, she argued bitterly for a general strike resolution against war this time. And of course, it was not to come. It was to be defeated. And in the final analysis, when it came down to the nitty-gritty, it was she herself who went to prison fighting war. 
and she made a speech after the Congress of Vienna, which had brought forth on the 16th of September of 18, 1913, in which she shouted, if the government thinks we are going to lift the weapons of murder against our French and other brethren, we will shout, we will not do it, for which she was arrested and sentenced to a year in prison. She was out on appeal when the First World War came, going up and down the land, again calling for resistance to the war. The whole party caved in, of course, in August of 1914. Her first act, to send out 300 letters to potential militants, organize the resistance to the war. 300 letters, one answer, not a second. And the two women of German social democracy try to do it alone. A fascinating story, largely from the point of view of what it takes to look through the illusion, because the reality was in Rosa Luxemburg's perception. As Tom Lehrer once wrote in a famous line in a song, you know about the Spanish Civil War, we had all the best songs and they won all the battles. She had all the insights, but they carried the party. of that strategic option are, because those consequences are very large. In the first place, what it meant for German socialism, and in fact for the socialism of the Second International, was something very crucial ideologically. It meant that Marxism came to be deformed, distorted, trivialized. Because we know perfectly well that the German Social Democratic Party repudiated revisionism. And when it repudiated revisionism, it hewed to a theoretical line, which was a variant of Marxism, as elaborated by Karl Kautsky, but a Marxism, after all, that eliminated anything of revolutionary practice from it, and that, after all, reduced Marxism to an ideology. An ideology which was nothing more than a blind faith in the ultimate collapse of capitalism. And so what you do is to trivialize and banalize Marxism within the entire framework of the Second International. But a second consequence of monumental importance for Germany, that at every crucial moment, after all, when a revolutionary situation might have gathered, that the directors of German social democracy acted over time in order to mute that revolutionary situation, in order to try to defuse it. And no example of that more crucial than the example of the year 1910, a year after all which was a great turning point in the life of Rosa Luxemburg, in which she came to believe fundamentally that Karl Kautsky was nothing but a coward, and that the entire German SPD 
which presumably have repudiated revisionism, was itself revisionist from top to bottom, because in that year 1910, there was a struggle over suffrage reform in Prussia. Not an insignificant issue when you remember that that suffrage was still anchored in the so-called three-class system, which meant that in the Prussian Landtag, a combination of Junkers and great industrialists dominated, and that that great Social Democratic Party in 1910 had only seven deputies in that Landtag, and there had been for a number of years a crescendo of demand that that suffrage law be changed, so that finally, on the 4th of February of 1910, the German Chancellor, who was also the Prime Minister of Prussia, and who was called Ben von Holme, introduced what he considered to be a law of reform. And the Ben von Holme law was so derisive, was so uh, insignificant, that immediately it touched off a mass uprising in the city of Berlin and in other Prussian cities. In other words, steep street demonstrations against what the German Chancellor was presuming to introduce as a real reform. And as it happened, those street demonstrations in Berlin and other cities coincided with economic strikes economic strikes in the minefields and also in the construction trades of such magnitude that the police and the army both had to be sent into the strike fields and then there happened what Rosa Luxemburg always looked for, an overlapping of these two movements of the economic strike and the political movement so that the strikers who were out and refused to go to work began to join these street demonstrations demanding democracy in Prussia, and suddenly Rosa Luxemburg was alive with the idea of insurrection. Suddenly the image of what had happened in Russia in 1905 seemed to appear before her eyes, and she was everywhere. She was in one speaking stump after another, exhorting and cajoling the workers to keep that movement alive and push it further. And then she wrote an article called Was Weiter, or What Next, an article in which she addressed herself to the leadership of the SPD. And she said that you must support this movement. She said that you have a role to play, which is to pose the goals always a little more clearly and a little higher than the workers do themselves. And when they reach those goals, to push the goals even higher, to demand a republic, then to demand socialism. In other words, she was making her formulation of that fusion between mass spontaneity and party, and the party had an obligation to do that here in 1910. But her article, of course, was turned down by the Social Democratic Daily Forwards, and even Karl Kautsky, in his theoretical magazine, Neue Zeit, refused to publish her article, which constituted the complete breach between Rosa and Kautsky at that particular time. And finally, what Rosa did was publish her article in a little uh, socialist review in Dortmund and continue on her speaking tour going up and down West Germany. And at that point, Kautsky answered her, answered the article which she had published elsewhere in an article which said, what now? And what Kautsky said was that the general or mass strike was a trap that the party couldn't get involved in that. What it had to do was to harvest the discontent in order to build an election victory in 1912, because that election victory would be another step in that electoral road to the revolution. So that it shouldn't surprise us that the leaders of the trade unions called back their workers and muted the strike movement, and that the leaders of the SPD doused with cold water the street demonstrations over the franchise movement, and the whole movement collapsed in 1910. And when Rosa Luxemburg went to the Congress of Magdeburg later that year to try to denounce the leadership, she was silenced. And so a final consequence, because what this strategic option meant was that the deputies in the party began to play an inordinately important role in its decisions. 
if you privilege electoral tactics, if you privilege parliamentary action, that the deputies begin to become inordinately important. And there were 110 of them who were elected in 1912. And even though the party claimed that it was keeping its distance from society, refusing to vote the budget, refusing to be contaminated and corrupted, the point is that deputies do collaborate. They sit on committees with other parties. They work out deals. Their whole mentality, after all, becomes a collaborationist mentality. Important to remember, because we said that on the 4th of August of 1914, when the Espe Day voted for war credits and consequently plunged wholeheartedly into the war effort in World War I, after opposing that war theoretically up to that time, we say that the German Social Democratic Party collapsed. We say with Lenin that it became a stinking corpse, to use his term. We say that it ceased to be an inheritor party, but became just another pressure group. But what I offer to you is the premise that it had already become that. That for two years at least before that war, that the deputies not only had gotten into a crucial position in party councils, but they had by their very methodology within the Reichstag already created that kind of pressure party to do more for the workers, but certainly not to make that revolution, which presumably was the end goal of that whole Kautskyist hypothesis. <coughs> Now you see, none of this shocks us. Because we have decades of history at our disposal. And so we are not very bemused by the glorious vision of popular sovereignty or by the revolutionary potential of parliamentary action or electoral politics. We have seen too often that socialists who become prime ministers don't function as socialist prime ministers. And we look, for example, at Willy Brandt's Social Democrats at the helm in Germany, or we look at Palmer's at the helm in Sweden, or at Kreitzer's at the helm in Austria, and we say, after all, that the ruling classes of those three countries are not quaking in their boots at all or losing sleep at night. And even more, we look and we see that that very social democratic troika is doing the most abominable thing, that it is playing at this moment the American card in Europe, that at this moment, after all, they are those European social democrats who are charting and subsidizing the anti-revolutionary course for Suarez and his Portuguese socialists, and that they would universalize that strategy for Europe, and consequently all of this does not shock us so much, but then remember, before 1914 it was different, and before 1914 there were working men and women and intellectuals who put everything on the line to espouse socialism and to build anti-capitalist parties and movements who put their jobs on the line and their position and at time their lives. And so we really have to ask the question, was it any different anywhere else? Just because the SPA Day was the biggest party in the Second International, do we have to assume that every other party was simply like the SPA Day in miniature? Should we spend any time, for example, our valuable time to discuss the working class movement in France in the period before 1914, where you don't even have a unified socialist party until 1905, where you don't even have as many as 10% of the active workforce enrolled in the CJK, the leading organ of revolutionary syndicalism in France. Is it worthwhile at all to look at that? And the answer, of course, is yes. Because not only is it a rich chapter in the history of the working class movement, but because we cannot leave any stone unturned in looking for answers and in looking for hypotheses, and there's something peculiar about that French movement before 1914, something peculiar in the fact 
that the labor movement was not anchored in trade unionism, but that the labor movement was anchored in something called revolutionary syndicalism, which after all eschewed and attacked parliamentary politics, which detested and wanted to undermine the state, which looked upon the emancipation of the working class as something that the workers themselves would do, and which viewed socialism as something that workers controlled, who viewed it after all in a manner autogestionnaire, that the workers themselves would come to control the instruments of production, and even in the halls of parliament, even when you deal with the parliamentary socialism of France before 1914, at the heights of that parliamentary socialism stood a Jean Jaurès, who for all of his weaknesses was different than all of the others, and who after all offers us the most dramatic moment in the whole history of the Second International before 1914, who stood on that August day in 1904 in the city of Amsterdam at the Sixth Congress of the Second International, and for one moment did the unthinkable, unmasked, unmasked the German Social Democratic Party, that which was held after all in such awe and envy, and tore the mask away and said that you are a paper tiger, that the only revolutionary commitment you have is what Kautsky puts on paper, that the whole socialist movement is dying under the weight of your particular impotence. And so there is something peculiar about that movement. Now remember, we have said over and again that in order to build a working class movement, and especially in those years before 1914, you must always remember what almost insuperable barriers working men and women had to try to scale and to penetrate. And it is well to remember what they are, even in France, which claims to be a republic, the third republic, which claims to be a democracy, in which presumably people are free to organize and the barriers are terrific. And let me suggest what those barriers are. Remember the word fool me, because fool me tells us an entire history about what violent repression by the ruling class is all about. Fool me is a massacre on May Day in 1891 in the industrial city of Fool me in the north. And it tells us, just as it told workers in France, what really the obstacles were. Now behind the Fool me massacre goes the May Day movement. And the May Day movement is, after all, something that you ought to know about, because the very seeds of the May Day movement are born and are, are spread in the United States. It's in America, in 1886, that American workers, more than 200,000 of them, leave their jobs on the 1st of May in a strike for the eight-hour day. And it is taken up by French workers the next year and in a little central organization of French trade unions called the National Federation of Syndicates, which was founded in 1886. The leader of that federation, a man named Raymond Lavigne, said that what the American workers have done, we should do. And the French took up the idea of a strike on May Day for the eight-hour day. And then, in 1889, at the founding congress of the Second International, that tactic of May Day for the eight-hour day was internationalized. And consequently, it was said that in every country, there should be a strike that day in order to reduce the working day. And so it happened that in 1890, in about 150 cities of France, there were peaceful demonstrations on May Day for the eight-hour day. And then came 1891, and in the city of Fool Me. And Fool Me was a textile city, about 16,000 in population. 
but a city in which there had been terrific social tension uh, because the textile trade had suffered depression, uh, because the bosses in the 1880s had persistently tried to reduce wages and to lengthen the work day in order to cut costs, and there had been a series of strikes. And so, in preparation for the May Day strike, there was a very brave worker in Colby named Cudi. And I call him Bray, this father of four young children, who actually had the guts to found a Marxist branch in the city of Fulmy, a branch of the Parti Oublier Francais, the French Workers' Party, which was the Marxist Party, and who here began to organize for a formidable demonstration on May Day, even to the point that he called in Paul Lafayette, who was, as you know, the son-in-law of Karl Marx and one of the important leaders of the French Workers' Party, of the Parti Ouvrier Francais, and Lafarge spoke in full me on the 12th of April of 1891, encouraging those working men and women really to go all out for that eight-hour day. And so came the 1st of May, and in the morning, a great peaceful crowd of about 1,500 working men and women with their children demonstrated in front of one of the textile mills, which had been most hostile to workers' demands. And there they met the police, and the police demanded that they disperse, and when they refused, arrested several of their leaders, and finally the crowd dispersed. That afternoon, a crowd of about 500 of them marched upon the city hall and there to demand the release of those comrades of theirs who had been arrested. And when they got to the city hall, they discovered that the prefect had of course sent in the troops. Two entire companies of troops, about 200 armed men, stood in front of the mayor Lee. Because property was at stake, because the whole question of whether workers could challenge that property was at stake, the commandant demanded that they disperse, they refused, and at point blank ordered the firing on that crowd. The fusillade de fooled me, the so-called massacre of fooled me, lasted four minutes, in the course of which nine workers, eight of whom were under 21, one of whom was 12 years old, were shot down, 33 wounded, of whom some 20 died within the next month. Nor was the retribution complete. After that massacre of Fool Me, the state decided that it was Culine and that it was Lafarge who had fomented that event, and they were brought to trial in front of a jury of industrialists and landowners, and consequently acclaimed guilty, the court sentenced Culine, the father of four, to six years in prison, sentenced Lafarge to a year in prison. And with what consequence, and what does that mean? In the short term, it emboldened those workers, because what they did immediately was to organize for the first time a union, a textile union which by June of 1891 had 3,500 members. And more than that, there was a vacancy in the parliament out of the city of Lille in the fall of 1891, and they put up Paul Lafarge, then sitting in prison as their candidate, and he was overwhelmingly elected by the textile workers of Lille in camaraderie with the textile workers of Fulmi. But in the long term, it's something else. Fulmi is a symbol. Fool me is a word, as well as a geographic place, in the calculations of French workers. Because we know that one of the most original contributions of the French syndicalist movement was anti-militarism. That it felt it had to get to the working class. It had to make the French workers anti-militarists, not only to hate the army, but when they got into the army, to refuse to bear arms against their fellow workers. What Fool Me indicated, not only that the ruling class would use force when necessary, but that they would use workers against workers, 
that they would use those workers conscripted into the army actually to shoot down those who were on strike or those who were demonstrating. Listen to this brilliant analysis. In La Voix de Peuple, the voice of the people, which is the weekly of the CGT, the General Confederation of Labor, which dates here from December 7, 1913. The oppressive edifice of bourgeois France rests upon five pillars, government, parliament, judiciary, police, and army. We must never relax our assault on the strongest column of these five, the army. This institution is created from our ranks and yet is used against us. We have to face the fact that the social revolution will remain a pipe dream so long as the army, the only national institution composed of workers and peasants, continues to decimate our ranks. Absolutely fundamental. There is just recently, in the last number of the Nouvel Observateur, an important French weekly, a long interview with André Malraux, and Malraux has posed the question at a certain point, do you think there is a possibility of a social revolution in an advanced industrial society? And Malraux answered quite properly. He said it all depends upon whether the ruling class chooses to use the army. And it really is at the center of all calculations and for these French syndicalists to have gotten to that point. When have revolutions succeeded? In Russia, when the army disintegrated and refused to fight. In China, after all, when, uh, when the Chang's Kuomintang army refused to fight. In Vietnam, when Chu's uh, army refused to fight. And what was it in the final analysis that so persuaded American military commanders that the American army Army couldn't go it anymore in Vietnam. I'm sorry to say I don't think it was the demonstrations at home, but the disintegration of the army on the field. And that disintegration very profound, and the propaganda that was made in that army by the troops themselves, absolutely fundamental to the grinding down of that particular military machine. And here are these French syndicalists who are talking, after all, about a sous de soldat, which I'll describe later, about actually a movement to send money to the workers who are conscripted into the army so that they can buy revolutionary newspapers, so that they can go to their bulls de travail and hear anti-militarist lectures and so forth to keep them against, after all, that whole kind of patriotic ideology. But you see, it isn't only sheer repression. And that's only the first of this aspect of the problem of barriers. Because it's also the ideological offensive. It's the whole strategy of mystification. I'm talking about the school now. I'm talking about the whole system of free public education. Remember that in the early decades of the Third French Republic, the most notable contribution that its architects made to the so-called democratization of France was to install a system of free secular public education. Now we know why they did that. It's no great mystery. On the one hand, there were certain practical needs. That is, that the workforce needed a minimum of education. Even if you had unskilled workers, for example, in plants, they had to be able to read the rules and the regulations. They had to know the instructions. When the bosses wrote something and put it on the wall, they had to be able to read it. There's something practical about that. Secondly, there is the idea of co-opting into the system at least the brightest that come out of the ranks of the popular classes. All of that is practical, but it's much more than that. You see, the whole system of free public education in France is rooted in two very important facts. It is rooted in the fact of the Franco-Prussian War. In other words, the necessity, after all, of standing head to Germany, of trying to mount some movement of revenge, of trying ultimately to vie with Germany for hegemony in Europe, and it's anchored in the commune. The idea that that kind of class struggle should never happen again. And consequently, what does free public education mean? What are its goals? It means, after all, that you must try to mute the division between classes. You must try to mute the class struggle. You must try to stabilize the whole system of French society and the whole system 
of, of French capitalism. You must try, after all, to wed all of the classes to something mystical, which is called la République, which is called the Republic, as though in some Hegelian sense, this Republic stood above all kinds of social divisions or class divisions. We do the same thing year after year when I went to school every single morning. I said, after all that Pledge of Allegiance, to one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And whoever thought that that was supposed to be describing the society one lived in? One nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. But we said it every damn day of our lives in that school. And that, after all, was the kind of devotion and dedication to la République, which was at the very core of this education. You see, it was to make patriots. It was to make soldiers who would be willing to die for the system and die for the republic. Now, this isn't an extrapolation. This is clear in the documents. You take, for example, the propaganda of the Ligue de l'Enseignement, the, the League of Education, of which was founded in 1866 by a man named Jean Marcel and which became an extremely powerful organization in propagandizing for free public education in France. And what Marseille and the Ligue de l'Enseignement were about is very clear in their pronouncements. First of all, to rally everybody to this bourgeois republic. In the second place, to really view regional and class differences to project the idea of a single indivisible patrie, or fatherland, and finally, as Massey put it in a speech, to have the French teachers do for revenge what the Prussian teachers did for victory. In other words, if the Prussian school teachers prepared German troops for the victory in 1870 and 71, let French school teachers prepare the troops for a revenge to get back Alsace and Lorraine and to hold head then against Germany. And we know that the architect of that system of education was the most important of these bourgeois republicans in the Third Republic, and that Jules Ferry. And Ferry, an absolute powerhouse, a guy who dominates the bourgeois republic between the years 1879 and 1885. During those six years, for five years, he is the Minister of Education. For three years, he is the Prime Minister. He really is the stabilizer of this bourgeois republic. And we know about Ferry. We know that he is a revanchard. That is, he wants revenge against Germany. He is, in that sense, an ultra-patriot. We know that he is an ardent imperialist that he is the architect of the French conquest in Tunisia and the French conquest in Indochina. But what we are inclined to forget is that this is a man traumatized all of his life by the Paris Commune. He witnessed the Paris Commune, he saw what it was, he saw the kind of class struggle there, and all of his speeches for the rest of his life are studded with terms like stability, like order, like harmony, like restraint and self-restraint. In other words, terms which indicate that there will never be another conflict of that kind. And so you get a Ferry who pushes through the education laws, the law of 1879, which provided for the creation of normal schools across the country in order to create the core of teachers for this free public education. And finally, the law of the 16th of June of 1881, setting down the system of free primary education for everybody so that you can now begin to bombard that peasantry and that working class. And we know what Ferry was about when he made that education system. He himself, in a speech of 1882, gives what he calls the motto of his political life. And the motto of his political life, I read it first in French, one line, pour la patrie, par le livre et par l'épée, for the fatherland, by the book and by the sword. And it is he, after all, who then spreads about, then spreads about all of those textbooks that are so patriotic 
that are so vulgar. I have just had a graduate student, Francis Feely, do a dissertation on French textbooks in that particular period. And I myself am not really, you know, very, very naive about these things, but it was a bit shocking nonetheless uh, to find some of the very blatant, not only attacks upon the commune, but upon the working class movement that made their way into history books, into geography books, and so forth, and constantly this kind of patriotic appeal to the heroism of the past. Now, all of that raises an interesting question. Can you make a revolution if you do not make a counterculture? And it's a question, again, that was raised within the cadre of this French working class movement. Because out of the anarchist ranks and out of the syndicalist ranks came a number of thinkers and a number of projectors who said that unless there is some other education, unless there is some real counterculture, it's almost impossible to cope with what the school does. I don't know whether you have a sense uh, in your own experience, or whether your experience coming much later than my own really parallels what I have experienced. I've been thinking about this because for a number of years now, in moments really that are bizarre moments, like when I'm ill, so I've been writing a kind of a strange autobiographical novel. It began with my grandfather, but it's getting finally down to me. Uh, and, and I've been, been examining those early school days. And I'm just writing about, about that seventh grade experience. You know, I don't know whether you have this experience. I remember the names of all those teachers. Uh, and in the seventh grade, there was a teacher called Miss Snyder, a short squat woman. Uh, and, uh, and at a certain point, we were supposed to go in the social studies thing. Uh, we were supposed to go because we lived in a New Jersey commune that was about uh, two hours from New York. And we were supposed to go on some tour of the, of the planetarium or some damnable thing in uh, New York City. Uh, and I had read in the paper that there was in the town hall going to be some lecture by Norman Thomas on socialism. And I proposed that that might be a good thing. And <laughs> That was impossible for two reasons. One, that it was in town hall, which had a very suspect reputation. I said, why? And she said, well, it's been known that communists go to town hall and they sit in the balcony and eat bananas. I have had that. <laughs> is a socialist, uh, and uh, you simply cannot listen to that, and you cannot, why do you want to listen to it? Whereupon I blurted out something, not really knowing what I was saying, I said, well, that's because I'm a socialist. I didn't really understand anything about what that meant, but in retrospect, as I just wrote the other day, I have had no reason ever to retract that, but I that until this. Uh, but it suffices to say at that point it was a little bit flu, and I went to the library to find out what it was that I was. <laughs> Point. But it suffices to say that there was that complete blockage that you couldn't mention uh, questions of that kind, and that fundamentally all of the issues, if any issues were discussed, were discussed within the framework of a kind of an American entity or an American unity. Well, that's, of course, what these syndicalists were about when they said you've got to have a counterculture. And that's why when I get to talking, for example, about Fernand Pelletier, uh, who is one of the great syndicalists, really the head and the heart of French revolutionary syndicalism, a guy who became the Secretary General of what was called the Big Last Gambe Bulls de Tabai, of the Bulls de Tabai being the uh, labor exchanges, really posed that particular question of workers' culture. Because Pelletier, who himself came from a bourgeois background, uh, who repudiated not only his own background, but the whole capitalist system, who devoted a very short life, he died when he was 33 years old, devoted a very short life to the self-liberation of the working class, to arranging it so that workers could understand what their misery was, and so that they could understand their identity as a class. And what Pelletier did was to say, these forces 
the Tavah. These labor exchanges must become a worker school system. We must have them go to those schools to Tavai, listen to lectures, have libraries there, learn not only a craft and a trade, but learn what their society is about. A horrendous, a magnificent effort on the part of Pelloutier to say that unless you cope with this constant ideological mystification, then really you are lost if you are trying to mount and to organize a revolutionary movement. So we talk about violent repression, and we talk about an ideological offensive, but take a third aspect of the problem that you find inscribed here in the history of the Third Republic. What about self-mystification? And I'm talking about the susceptibility of workers to demagogic movements. Uh, to movements that appear to be attacking, let us say, the, uh, the, the oligarchy that runs the society, but turn out to be mass movements of the right. And you get a classic example of that in France in the years between 1885 and 1889, because those are the years of what we call Boulangism the years of Boulangism, which is important to us, not only because it is sort of an echo of Bonapartism, but because already it begins to point to some of the attractions, some of the seductions of fascism as a mass movement. You see, it mounts here in the mid-1880s, and we know what the fertile soil of Boulangism is. In the first place, it's the very severe depression. The workers are really strapped, they're up against the wall, and they find that the parliament, that the bourgeois government, does nothing for them. Their contempt for the government reaches great heights. In the second place, we find that that government itself is very unstable. After the death of Thierry in 1885, there comes what is called the Valls des Ministres, the Walls of Ministers. You begin to get a complete turnover of ministers every month, every two months, which begins to disenchant the middle classes. In other words, the middle classes who themselves are hurting from the Depression and also want some kind of strength at the center, want something they can believe in. You can understand this because it's a kind of a Watergate situation. What can you believe in, in the central government? And in that context, mounts a terrific nationalism. A nationalism predicated on the ground that France must reassert her strength, reassert her greatness, must really make revenge against Germany, and that this government will never be able to do it. And there was, after all, an organization, especially organized, that became very powerful, called the Ligue des Patriotes, the League of Patriots, headed by Paul Desmoulins, which enrolled, if you please, within three years, founded in 1882, within three years enrolled 200,000 members. And its motto was that if you revise the government, you will revise the Treaty of Frankfurt. In other words, if you get another kind of government, one that isn't weak, one that isn't venal, then you will be able to revise the effects of that Treaty of Frankfurt, which ripped Alsace and Lorraine away. And consequently, you begin to see what is at stake. You begin to see that the workers will be seduced by a very faulty historic memory. And this is really a danger. And the historic memory is, of course, of Jacobinism, of revolutionary Jacobinism. That what is it, after all, that begins to combine social demand, demand for real social change, along with national greatness? It's a popular dictatorship, a Jacobin dictatorship. And consequently, the workers are really ripe for that sort of thing, and into the scene comes General Boulanger. Now, General Boulanger is, of course, what you can imagine. Uh, General Boulanger is handsome, and he's dashing, and he looks fine on a horse, and consequently, he comes up from Tunisia, uh, where he had been commander of the French troops, and he enters the French government, the French ministry, the third place he'd ministry in January of 1886 as the Minister of War. And when he's the Minister of War, he already is demagogic. 
He's already playing to the left. There's the Dukasville strike, very, very big strike in 1886. The troops are sent down there, and of course, as Minister of War, he has to order the troops down into the strike field. And as he does, he says, yes, the troops will go down into the strike field, but every soldier will share his bread with every striker. And that's plotted in certain working class circles. And with all of that kind of demagoguery, Boulanger begins to talk about revenge about what really will be the sign of a French resurgence will be vengeance uh, taken against Germany. And consequently, by 1887, uh, Boulanger begins to be a nuisance to the conservative Republicans. They drop him from the ministry and decide, well, what you do with a general who begins to get dangerous, we will put him in charge of the barracks in Clermont-Ferrand. And consequently, they send Boulanger uh, down to Clermont-Ferrand to be charged to be put in charge of the 13th Army Corps at that station down there, but he's supposed to leave from the Gare de Lyon in Paris on the 7th of July of 1887, and when he is supposed to leave, an immense crowd goes to the Gare de Lyon to try to prevent the train from going away. Keep the general there. They sing the Marseillaise. They sing General Le Manche, which is a song made in his honor. Uh, Boulanger wasn't up to that sort of thing. He didn't know what to do with this huge crowd. He leaped on the locomotive and took off. And consequently, actually went down to Clermont Ferrand. But it's already indicative that there was, of the shock troops of Boulangism were the popular classes. That the shock troops, after all, uh, were sans pilote, uh, were those out of the working class and those out of the petty bourgeois. But, having said that, it is not a movement of the left. Because Boulanger is in very, very close touch with forces of the right, with Baron de Baco of the Union of the Right, with certain financiers. In other words, it takes on the allure of a mass movement, but the connections are very decidedly and very distinctly with the right. And consequently, Boulangism crests by 1889 through various election campaigns in which the general stands for uh, in by-elections and wins, wins even in Paris in January of 1889, but then the movement suddenly collapses, collapses on the basis of the cowardice of Boulanger himself, because in 1889, remember this, but 1889, he's a very tough-minded kind of minister of the interior, a guy named Constance. He really ripped off a poor when he was governor general in Indochina, wasn't about to have that good thing threatened by this general, whoever the hell he was, and consequently, Constance gave out the rumor that he was going to arrest Boulanger and bring him up to trial before the High Court of Treason, which would be the Senate, and consequently, Boulanger panicked and fled to Brussels. The movement collapsed. But what's important to us is that there was a seduction of Boulangisme for the working class. And that seduction is very crucial because the movement was not a movement of class, it was a movement that was populist. It had all of the mystery, all the mystification of populism. It was le peuple against the system. It was the people against those who were despoiling them. What I'm saying is that in their misery, workers could be deceived into movements of that kind and deceived all of too easily. And it's within that context of repression, of, uh, of a kind of mystification and a kind of self-deception that the planting and the spread of the French working class movement, it strikes me, is all the more remarkable. Now that movement, it seems to me, can be periodized very quickly. Talking about the history of French socialism in that period, you're talking, first of all, about a decade of the 1880s, which is a decade that we call the apocalyptic period. In other words, a period when you have very tiny groups that hardly add up to parties at all, which, for the most part, expect the imminent collapse of capitalism, expect, really, in that Depression decade, that the system is going to collapse very quickly. There's only one group among them that really is it's a group called the Fédération des Travailleurs. Uh, it's the group of Paul Blues. Uh, these are certain socialists called possibilists, or, or those who, who are for what is possible, who are municipalists, 
who believe in uh, a certain kind of municipal ownership of the means of production and so forth. But this is a very small group. For the most part, what you have are tiny sects, all of which share certain perspectives. They're anti-state, they're anti-reform, they think the system will collapse, they expect fully that there will be a violent revolution. If they differ, it's on whether you use electoral tactics at all. Uh, you get the Geddes and the Blanquists, uh, those who are followers of Blanqui, those who are the Mar so-called French Marxists, who believe that you have to use elections in order to spread your propaganda around. There are the anarchists who say that that is a deception, that is a sellout, that you never use the electoral process at all. Out of that entire group in the 1880s, the one group that really is interesting and that will take on some importance later on is the Passe Oublier Francais, which is the PLF and which is what we call, for lack of a better term, the French Marxist Party. And what the POS is as a French Marxist party is, first of all, that it has Paul Lacan in it, who is the son-in-law of Marx, that Marx helped to write its founding program in 1880, and that its real leader, who was Gilles Gued, actually espoused what he thought was Marxism. But you see, there never really is a French Marxism. There never really is a single theoretical contribution to Marxist theory that comes out of France in the period before 1914. The Marxist party is very schematic, very uh, uh, catechistic. Uh, you get a Gilles Gued who learns a few principles and simply repeats them in speech after speech. But what you get in the Parti Oublier Francais are two incredible propagandists. I want you to see if you can understand what it is to plan something in infertile terrain for people to put themselves on the line and constantly assault the consciousness of workers with a certain kind of propaganda. You talk about Gilles Gued, and it's for perfectly good reason that that KOF is sometimes called the Geddes Party, because he was so overwhelming. And you've got to really have a picture of Gued in your mind. This is a rather elongated, very gaunt guy, with very long hair, with a long beard, with glasses that were extremely thick, with a very El Greco face, with a metallic voice, with a kind of tremendous torrent, a real torrent of hatred when he talked about capitalism, who between 1885 and 1889 made 1,200 speeches in France to one working class group after another. You're talking about someone who never stopped, not for a minute, saying in his so-called Marxism, which really was Geddes catechism, that the system will collapse Collapse, the revolution will come, you must organize for the revolution. It was as simple as that, but it caught fire as Gedd spoke and as he moved around. And with him, one of the great journalists, one of the great propagandists with the pen of the French socialist movement, and that Paul Lafayette. Now you would love Lafayette, really, when you get right down to it, because Lafayette has something that's very, very contemporary. Lafayette was an epicure. He really liked to live. He was, you know, married to Laura, who was one of Marx's daughters, and both of them committed suicide, a double suicide, in 1911, because they got to be 70 years old, and they decided there was no fun left, and consequently they did themselves in at that point. Uh, but but Lafayette, you see, had a certain kind of Morton pen. Well, he's a very bizarre guy. You know, he's born in Cuba, for one thing, uh, which is strange for somebody who militates in the French Socialist Party. He's born in Cuba, and he's born of a French father and a mother who is half, Malacca, who is half black and half Jewish. A strange mulatto combination, and works his way into France via Louisiana. Well, it's a very long story, suffice it to say. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Lafayette finally becomes this propagandist who is capable of writing something like Droi la paresse, the right to laziness. And the right to laziness, or the right to be lazy, is really one of the creative tracts written in this period before 1914. and became reprinted and often cited in the May uh, 1968 movement in France. Because, you see, what Lafayette does is to say, the droit de la paresse, the right to be lazy, is my answer to the droit au travail, the right to work. Now, why in hell?
hell of workers constantly being demanding the right to work. Or work is their enslavement. Here is 1848. They're constantly demanding the right to work. They're beating down the doors of the capitalists saying, give us work. Now what they do is demand work. As soon as they're out of work, they immediately try to find other work. And they take it at any conditions. No matter what the pay. No matter how long the hours. The result is twofold. First of all, they destroy themselves as consumers. They never make enough, after all, so that they can consume adequately, so that the system can function. Secondly, they work these immensely long hours and obviously create overproduction. And when they create overproduction, what happens is, of course, that they're laid off and their misery is increased. In the third place, says Lafave, when the capitalists need markets, they can't find it among these workers who are willing to work for anything, and they begin to go into those other lands where people, in his description, is marvelous, where he says peoples are lying there, smoking cigarettes, enjoying life, lying in the sun and so forth, <laughs> and suddenly the work ethic is imposed upon them. Railroads are built, factories are built, and before long, they're being made into consumers and into producers into these other territories. No, says Papa. What ought to be done is that workers ought to demand very short hours at very high pay. Excellent. Because if they work three hours a day at high pay, they will force others who are now the parasites and who have to be parasites because all they do is consume, since workers can consume, force others to work also. And in the second place, they'll be able finally to enjoy life. That the instinct of human beings, says Lafayette, is not to work. The instinct of human <laughs> beings is to want to enjoy, to have the leisure, after all, to develop intellectually, to do physical things, to do the things that really are extremely meaningful. There really was a kind of cultural insight into something profound. Now, workers, when they made their demands, we're operating inside the work ethic. And you know this comes back in contemporary movements a great deal. You may know in that marvelous book uh, that Macchiotti has produced called Letters from the Interior of the, Depart of the uh, Party, which are her letters uh, with, uh, with Althusser in, in the French party. And Macchiotti is marvelous, you know. She was an Italian communist at the party now. But she was at that time writing from Naples, where she was running for, uh, for the assembly. And she was walking around a great deal in the outside. And in one of those letters, she tells the story, which really illustrates something of what Mafalg is talking about. She tells the story of a, a very well-dressed Italian businessman who's walking briskly to his office in the morning. And he walks past the river there, or the bay in Naples. And he sees this boy, uh, 19 years old, lying there uh, practically naked in the sun. So he can't stand it. What is this person at 9 in the morning doing just sunning himself, you know? So he pokes him and he says, why aren't it, you should be at work? Uh, and the boy said, why? Well, so that you can earn money. And he said, and then what? Well, then you can save some money. Yes, and then what? Well, then you can get yourself some more education and get a better job. And then what? Well, then you make more money, you see, and then you're able to get married and you have a house of your own. And he says, yes, and then what? Well, then, of course, uh, you have children and you can educate them because you have more money and you have saved more and you're working hard. You educate your children, they get excellent jobs. The boy says, yes, and then what? <laughs> well, he says, then you come to a point where you have enough and you can take these very elaborate holidays and vacations. Or you can go on steamer trips. <laughs> and the boy says, yes, and then what? He said, well, then if you choose, you know, you are so well fixed and so forth that if you just want, you can take your clothes off and lie in the sun. The boy said, well, that's what I'm doing. imperceptibly at first, toward a, uh, toward a movement, toward a socialist movement that's much more integrationist, much less apocalyptic, much more reformist in its entire approach. It uh, comes first through municipal elections. That socialists actually begin to win certain municipal elections. 
Uh, the Geddes, for example, in 1892 in the municipal elections, won 22 city halls, picked up 600 municipal seats uh, over France, and consequently, if you're involved in these municipal activities, quite obviously what you're doing is bargaining, quite obviously what you're doing is reforming in order to improve a lot of the workers. In the second place, there were the lessons of the Boulangist movement that began to penetrate, which was that you actually could mount a mass movement that might capture political power. In other words, that if Boulanger could win all of those by-elections, why couldn't a socialist movement on a mass base really move in the same direction? In the third place, you get that very important election of 1893. The national elections of 1893, when for the first time, the socialists put 50 uh, deputies into the parliament. 50 deputies of various schools and of various sects, to be sure, but you can see what the, the whole impact of this is from the point of view of what Ged writes on the 26th of August of 1893, after these 1893 elections. Sunday's election, he says, is the beginning of a veritable revolution which will emancipate the workers. Legally, by the workers' will, uh, legally, by the workers' will itself becoming law, the social transformation will be accomplished. In other words, you begin to get, within the pattern, quite obviously, within the pattern of a changed conjuncture, of a time when capitalism is recovering, you begin to get the socialists more and more thinking that they can bargain for reforms, thinking that it is possible, step by step, election by election, finally to come to power. Now this is nothing different than you get in the SPD. day. Nothing different, let us say, that you would get in the German experience at all. Except it comes to a certain extremism in France because it is all crystallized in a program called the saint Monday program, which really is important because it does illustrate how far you can go in this direction. Now, the saint Monday program is enunciated on the 31st of May of 1896. The saint Monday is a district in Paris, and it is there that a big socialist banquet was held on the 31st of May. And that socialist banquet was held to celebrate the victories that the socialists had just won in the municipal elections of 1896. And the principal speaker was a socialist named Alexandre Millelon. Now, Millelon illustrates really the change in French socialism because he himself is a lawyer who had been a radical Republican to begin with, who simply had defended certain workers' causes, had defended strikers and so forth, but who had no spirit of revolt, had no international vocation. In other words, was somebody who had no socialist tradition. And here, at the saint Monde program, Millevant stands up in front of representatives of all conceivable socialist groups in France, and says what we need is a common point of view in order to win elections, so that people in the country will know who a socialist is. And he enunciates this common point of view. What he says is that our goal is that every individual in France shall have a maximum of liberty and poverty. Now, since capitalism prevents individuals from really expanding private property or acquiring private property, what we must do is to expand the area of social property. Little by little, we must collectivize, we must municipalize, so that people have the largest access to this particular social property. And he then concludes by saying that we repudiate violence. We are Republicans, and we certainly don't want to overthrow the Republic. We will have recourse only to universal suffrage and no other means. Now, the curious thing is that Ged was there, and Lafayette was there, and Bayant of the Baptiste was there, and they all approved that particular statement. Nobody made any real objection. That's how far French socialism had gone down the reformist path. But having said that, let me then say that nonetheless, there was something different about it. And the something different comes, I think, in the use, first of all, of the public forum, and the use of that public forum by Jaurès, and secondly, by a kind of strategic position that Jaurès developed, 
but it really was different. And that tells us something interesting enough, at least for us to speculate about. Because you see, the Chauvet, who was unique as an orator beyond question, was able to use the Chamber of Deputies, was able to use the courts when he defended people in the courts, with a kind of bravado, with a kind of resonance that really extended far beyond the limits of those particular debates. You take, for example, the, the instance of Jean in the Cour d'Assises, in the court, uh, uh, in, in the highest French court, uh, in November of 1894. And he's there defending a socialist journalist named Gerald Richard, who had been accused of insulting the President of the Republic, and consequently had been sentenced to a year in prison. Well, in fact, uh, Gerald Richard had insulted the President of the Republic, and for good reason. Uh, the President of the Republic was Casimir Pellier, the grandson of that Casimir Pellier, whom you remember uh, from the era of Louis Philippe, and the same Pellier family that had been exploitative from beginning to end. Well, this was a man of tremendous vanity and tremendous orgueil, uh, this Casimir Pellier, who when he traveled around France, uh, wanted the applause of the people and never got it. And so Gérald Richard, in his little newspaper called Le Chambard, uh, wrote an article in which he said, well, he said, uh, Casimir Perrier, the president, uh, hates the people because they don't applaud him. But their, his hatred of them is, uh, is reproduced a hundredfold by the people who simply detest him. He's lucky, as he passes around France, that people are silent because tomorrow they're going to say, Abba Casimir, now with Casimir, fine. Well, for that, of course, that was considered an insult to the president, and consequently off to jail, Gérald Richard went. But he was defended by Jaurès in the Cour d'Assises. And what Jaurès did in a speech that became really a very celebrated pamphlet was to make something of a history of that Casimir Pellier family. And this is rather important. This is the idea, you see, that got to be conveyed of who owns the republic, who owns the society, something that we really never sufficiently ask when we think about our own society. From the first Casimir Pellier has descended a family tradition, at once authoritarian, greedy, selfish, bloodstained. What has it meant for the Third Republic to raise such a man to the presidency? Every regime must have its symbol, a visible sign by which it reveals its soul. We wanted to create the Republic of Rich Exploiters. Very well. The estate on which the President of the Republic promulgates his laws is the very soil of exploitation. For the well-being of our country, I prefer the whorehouses of the old regime, where the French kings wenched and died, to the backing houses of contemporary times where our society is bought and sold. Well, the president of the court was absolutely incensed, and he said, Monsieur Jaurès, you have just compared the Élysée Palace to a whorehouse. And Jaurès said, I have not. I have put it below. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, it's exactly that kind of stuff that resonated in the countryside. And what you get with Jaurès, just to speak about him monetarily, uh, and with, uh, with a certain regret, uh, because I spent six years of my life with Jaurès at one point, uh, until it got, and, and then edited a bulletin called the Bulletin of the Jaurès Society, until it got up to here, and I never wanted to talk about him again. Uh, but it suffices to say that it's hard to purge him out of your consciousness, because there was something strange about him. You see, with Jaurès, you have somebody who evolved the other way. The older he got, the more revolutionary he got, which is very, very nice. And the day he died, he was assassinated, 10.10 in the evening, on the 31st of July of 1914, right before the war, the first real martyr of the war. When he died at the Café de Poisson, he was more revolutionary than he had ever been in his entire life. And this is a guy, you see, who started out as a 26-year-old deputy in the, in the party of Gilles Ferry, and who by the time he died was willing to call a general strike against the war that was coming, literally to undermine that kind of patriotism with which he had begun. This is a guy who began by thinking that France had a civilizing mission in the colonies, and who by the time he died was the only one who was saying 
that the people that had been colonized would have the last word, and that the new era would be the era of those anti-colonial revolutions which would emanate from the Third World. And this was a guy who, every moment of his life, could have sold out that is, was a brilliant intellectual, a philosopher, a doctorate in philosophy, I was a person who was called upon to be an examiner at the Sorbonne, very frequently in examinations in philosophy, and did a lovely thing, incidentally. If you want to know what your teacher should do, if you take graduate exams, and if you ever come up to an oral, they should do what Jolas did. He'd go into the Sorbonne, you know, and this candidate would sit there, you know, in these damnable amphitheaters with maybe 500 people in the audience, you know, while you sit there for six hours and answer these questions. And Jolas would always say you are doing philosophy. Uh, who in the history of philosophy do you know best? And the candidate would say Hegel or Plato or whatever, and he would question on it. He would say, I see no reason to ask you about philosophers you don't know. I'm interested in your mind and what you can do with it. And consequently, it was always that sort of thing. It was the idea of a dialogue that really was a productive one. And the guy dialogued all over the place. He went through those hills at the town, for example, into those little villages. I've been all through that countryside, uh, into those really backwash villages, and talked the patois of those peasants. Was down on those strike fields at Armentier in 1993, uh, in Calmo in 1895. And I think of him, you know, out in the place Saint Gervais on the 15th of May of 1913. They called an anti war meeting in 24 hours, got 150,000 people out to the place Saint Gervais, and there was your last, no microphones in those days on a hill speaking to 150,000 people, and I swear to God that everybody that's left the memory says he was heard all over the place, and consequently it was that kind of a brilliant sort of a, of a contact uh, that he had at every point. But you see, you can't pass him off, this is the point, you can't pass him off as a parliamentarian. Jolas's point was summed up in an article in Cosmopolis in 1898. He said the important thing is to act. You act wherever possible possible and wherever necessary. If he's a man of the parliament, if he's a man of the committees and so forth. I think of him, for example, in 1909, at the head of an immense manifestation of 500,000. It was at the time then when Francisco Ferrer had just been executed in Spain. The Ferrer, that magnificent teacher, an anarchist and libertarian who had founded the Escuela Moderna, the modern school in Spain, with all of its very libertarian ideas. And Ferrer had been accused of having fomented the uprising of 1909 in Spain and consequently executed. And there is Oles at the head of a cortege of 500,000, never stopping for a moment, demanding vengeance for that execution of Ferrer. Or I see him the next year, in 1900. At the head of 200,000 in the streets, at the time that a worker named Leo Book was executed, and that worker executed because he had wounded a policeman uh, trying to arrest him, and there is your less demanding justice for the working class under those circumstances. So you see, the point is that you're dealing with somebody for whom praxis, 